The topic is hierarchical Bayesian models of cognition. Most of what I present is based on my interpretation of the paper A Tutorial Introduction to Bayesian Models of Cognitive Development by Perfos et al. If I get anything wrong, it's not their fault. It's a good paper. So by the end, I hope that you will know how to apply Bayes' theorem to more than two possible states of the world how that generalizes to the continuous case, what is a hierarchical Bayesian model, what is a hypothesis space, why does a Bayesian interpretation of evidence favor more specific hypotheses over vague hypotheses, what is an overhypothesis, how does a hierarchical Bayesian model balance goodness of fit against simplicity, and how does perceived precision tilt that balance of goodness of fit against uh, simplicity. So let's look at a calculation of Bayes' theorem the way that Giga Renza calculates it. Imagine that you see someone who's coughing and you say the possible reasons for the cough could be a cold, cancer, or heartburn, that is indigestion. And you have the following likelihoods. You say, the conditional probability, the likelihood of coughing given that you have a cold is 0.8. So out of every 10 people who have a cold, eight of them cough. Then you look at cancer, specifically say lung cancer. And you say that of the people who have lung cancer, out of every 10 people who have lung cancer, nine of them cough. And the likelihood for heartburn for indigestion, out of every 10 people who have that, only one of them coughs. So that is a likelihood of 0 0.1. So then let's say we have 100 people and they then distribute according to these prior probabilities such that 0.4, 40%, so 40 people have indigestion, 10 in this population have lung cancer, and 50 have a cold, which reflects the fact that colds are simply more common. Then we look at the effects of the likelihoods. So out of the 50 people with a cold, 80%, that's 40 of them, will be coughing. So basically they can end up in that population we're looking at, people who actually cough. And 10%, sorry, 20%, these 10 here, we miss. Then out of those 10 people with lung cancer, nine of them cough, one of them doesn't. And out of the four people, uh, 40 people with heartburn, four of them cough and 36 don't. So now we have a total of 53 people who cough and now the posterior probabilities here are then 40 over 53, 9 over 53, and 4 over 53. So that will then be 0.75, so just over 75% for cold. And that is down, uh, sorry, that is up from the prior of 0.5. So that has become more likely. Then we're looking at the lung cancer that had a prior probability of 0.1. That is now 9 over 53. So that is up from 0.1 from 10% to very nearly 17%, 0.1698. And then when we look at the people who cough, they're less likely than in the prior case. Um, to have heartburn indigestion. So that's now only four out of 53, these 0 0.0755, so just over seven and a half percent. So Bayes' theorem can be applied to more than two states of the world. So here in this case, it was three uh, states of the world, namely that people have a cold, lung cancer, or heartburn. Then imagine you apply it to 10 different cases. So you have a nice carpet on your veranda, you find a muddy paw print on it. And there are 
10 dogs of different sizes going from a tiny chihuahua to an enormous Irish wolfhound. And you have some prior probabilities of each of those visiting. So the chihuahua is somewhat likely, the next larger a dachshund is a bit more likely, a sort of small to medium sized dog is a most likely, and then the Irish wolfhound visits you, visits your garden only very uh, uh, rarely. But when you look at the likelihoods, that looks pretty big. Now it could be a relatively small dog that has just uh, accumulated a lot of mud on the paws and that there was a bit of rain which spread it all out and that therefore this muddy footprint, this muddy paw print looks enormous even though the dog was pretty small. But you think it's that, it's not likely, you didn't notice any rain, you don't think that a small dog could have accumulated that much mud. And so basically it's more likely to be a largish dog, though it doesn't look large enough for the Irish wolfhound. So that seems to be not so likely. When you then do the same calculations that I've just done for the three cases, then you end up with a posterior distribution over these 10 cases that looks like this. And then you can generalize that also to probability distributions such that you uh, have, for example, um, to normal distributions, one is your expectation for how data look like in a prior. For example, you say uh, shoot arrows at a target, you expect a particular distribution, that is your prediction. You have possibly a somewhat different experience and a, a different sensory experience and that then produces a posterior uh, judgment where your prior, your expectation, somewhat distorts your uh, interpretation of the sensory uh, data. So now let's apply this to uh, 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 the hierarchical Bayesian models. So the notion then is that if we have a continuous case, if we have continuous data, we can describe a hypothesis by, uh, by the coordinates in an abstract space. So we can have a graphical representation of hypotheses. So think of the following. I am plotting here uh, the income versus age of various professions. So there might be professions where the more experience you have, the more money you get. There might also be professions where you start off uh, earning uh, reasonably well, but then uh, the earnings go down. So that might be uh, child stars in the movies, um, to some extent, though pitch shifted to the right, uh, that would be models who uh, tend to uh, earn money when they're relatively young. Uh, you might have, again, a job where you get more, but where extra experience doesn't give you a lot. You might have a job which just pays the minimum wage, say, burger flipping at a fast food joint, uh, and where the pay just stays steady over time. And these various possibilities here I have captured in a very simple model where I have a multiplier and the power. So basically I have here, for example, um, x uh, to the power of 0.5. So that's a square root. With that multiplier, I have something to the power of 0.25, uh, the um, quadratic uh, root. Here I have some multiplier to the power of zero. So that is just staying flat. And I then have these things here where I have negative exponents and uh, these multipliers. So for each of these curves, I have two parameters. One of them is a factor and the other is an exponent. Uh, 
if I now plot these, then, so uh, for example, here I have the exponent, here I've got the factor, then I have this kind of space. So each of those curves is one point in that two-dimensional space defined by one parameter here on the horizontal, the exponent, and on the other axis, this multiplying factor. And so if I say that these describe the complete universe of possible multipliers and exponents, then I have a hypothesis that the world contains only those combinations. Or if I say these are a representative sample of possible relationships, then uh, I predict that uh, the actual earnings, the actual equations for earnings, that these parameters populate a space somewhere like this. That's about this big. And the more varied the factors are, the larger the distribution, the more extended the distribution of these points along the vertical axis, the more varied the exponents are, the wider the distribution along the horizontal axis. And of course, if the exponents only have small variation, then this hypothesis takes up little space in the horizontal axis. So basically, a very specific hypothesis takes up a small space, a small area or volume in this hypothesis space, and a vague hypothesis takes up a lot of space, a lot of volume uh, in the hypothesis space. And of course, the number of dimensions of the hypothesis space uh, depends on how many parameters are needed to describe the hypothesis. So the more parameters, the more dimensions to the hypothesis space. Uh, the examples here will be two-dimensional because otherwise we can't draw it, except for a case later on, which, which I'll uh, explain. But again, I can only show two dimensions. So then a hypothesis space can be thought of as a set of all possible hypotheses defined by the structure of the problem the learner can entertain. So the structure would be what parameters go into the uh, hypothesis space and form the axes of that space, the dimensions of this space. And then this figure shows a possible hypothesis space for a particular sample, and all the hypotheses would be uh, in this case, the assumption is that each hypothesis has a range on the horizontal axis and a maximum range on the vertical axis, and that therefore the hypotheses are always rectangles. So there's an additional assumption in there. And all the possible hypotheses are drawn as rectangles. Well, what's shown here is only a small subset because, of course, there are infinitely many rectangles, even if you have a finite hypothesis space. So only a few representative hypotheses are shown here. Then one question is from where do you get your hypothesis space? So Perfos et al. promise that you don't have to build it a priori, that you can learn it. So you might learn it simply from experience, where you have some idea uh, from experience how much the uh, data can vary along each of these parameters. Uh, and along each of those dimensions, and also how many dimensions there are. Um, uh, you may also be able to build a causal model for a process that generates possible data. So is there a process that generates your data? That would be a generative model derived from causal reasoning. Do you have previous experience telling you what data to ex expect given different states of the world? So that would be a generative model derived from statistical data. And those statistical data could come from an over hypothesis, which I will explain later. Either way, the generative model is expressed as a likelihood. So the probability of the data, given that a particular state of the world generates those data. So in my previous example, the probability of a cough, given that someone has a cold, that is a likelihood or a generative model. Now, let's look at a, a causal uh, generative model. Um, the vowels in uh, speech 
are generated by having the vocal cords vibrating at a fundamental frequency and uh, plus harmonics. So a harmonic sound is something that uh, at a multiple of uh, the frequency of the fundamental um, frequency. So uh, the vocal cords tend to produce a harmonic sound and then by varying the sizes of these uh, resonance cavities, you can selectively enhance or weaken some frequency bands. So the idea is, for example, if you pluck a guitar string, it can vibrate like this. That would give you the fundamental frequency. It has another vibration mode, which has basically two waves within that length. And that vibration mode vibrates at twice the frequency of the fundamental. Another vibration mode looks like this, vibrating at three times the frequency of the fundamental, and so on. And so if you then, for example, look at a guitar, uh, depending, of course, on the size of the resonance cavity, the body of the guitar, uh, it amplifies in the mid-range. And so here, on a logarithmic scale. Uh, so this is always then a multiple. So this here looks like about 180 hertz uh, of the fundamental frequency. Each of those gaps is again 180 hertz. It's only because of the logarithmic uh, scale here that it looks like it's squashed together. And then you get this envelope when this frequency here is amplified the most, resonates the most within that size of guitar body and other frequencies less so. Here, a saxophone might look, would look like this, an alto saxophone. One thing you can see here is that actually the fundamental frequency is not a very strong one, but still that you perceive these as the same pitch, but you have a different quality to the sound between guitar and saxophone. Then if you have that here, so if you have, for example, just a decline in the um, amplitude of these higher harmonics, then you would get an envelope like this for a low pitched sound. You would get an envelope like this for a high pitched sound where the fundamental frequency is higher. So that's the idea. You have a periodic uh, signal. You have here a variable filter, which means different frequencies get amplified or weakened to different extents. You have an output sound. So what you then can do by varying two cavities in their size is that you put an envelope like this here on top. So that this here, so this here would be the sound generated by the vocal cords. This now gets multiplied by this. And so you end up with something that looks like this, where this harmonic here gets amplified most, then there is less. And here, this harmonic again gets amplified. And this here would be called the first formant, so the harmonic with the lowest frequency. This here would be called the second formant. And then different vowel sounds in the English language can be plotted on this space, this parameter space, where on one axis you have the frequency of the first formant. So for soon, soon has a low first formant, but seat also the E sound has a low first formant, they differ in the second formant. So for soon, the second formant is somewhere here. And for seat, the second formant is out here and so on. And so these various combinations then give you the different vowel sounds. So that is one way in which you could build a hypothesis space. You say, I know the sizes of these uh, resonance cavities, I know the properties of the vocal cord, and so I know that these formants can only be within that range. So that would be getting uh, um, a hypothesis from a causal generative model. But you could also simply have experience. So it, it 
takes a fair bit of physics to derive this thing, uh, this kind of space, this possible space uh, from, uh, well, physics and anatomy to derive this from first causal principles. Most people learn these vowel sounds which are without having any idea of the physics at all. So they get this simply from experience through purely statistical data then. Then one question is, if you have hypotheses at different levels, for example, you see this dog, it might be that this dog specifically is called Fido. The dog is a Labrador and it's a dog and it's an animal and it's a living thing. So what level of category do you adopt? What level of category do you consider relevant when you see this animal? Is it dog? Is it Labrador? And so on. What if you see this here? Is it specifically a redwood? Is it an example of a tree? Is it an example of a plant? Is it an example of a living thing? So these more general categories then are vaguer. They take up a larger volume in that hypothesis space. A more specific category says there are only a few things that can look exactly like this. So that is a more specific hypothesis. It has a smaller volume in the hypothesis space in however many dimensions describe what you've got. And if you've ever um, uh, used a taxonomic key, a book that lets you identify uh, organisms, you know that there are quite a lot of parameters to look at, a lot of things that distinguish species from each other. So you have a space with many dimensions there. Now, imagine that you have a data point, a single data point, you have a single observation and you're trying to work out which of these various hypotheses most likely describes the data you've gotten. So you might have say your prior is that all the hypotheses are equally likely. How do you now get to the posterior probability? You've gotten a data point. What is the posterior probability of each of those um, uh, hypotheses? And for that, of course, we need some estimate of the likelihood. And for that, let's now compare this hypothesis outlined in red. So just by eyeballing, I'm guessing that this, the diameter of this dot is about one seventh of the dimensions, horizontal and vertical of this hypothesis. And ignoring that this thing is round and not square, that means about 49 dots, distinct dots would fit in there. So this dot with its uncertainty, so that's why it's not an infinitely a small point, it's actually a dot with a finite area because there's a bit of uncertainty in what exactly your uh, uh, data are. So uh, that this is 1 49th, which I've rounded to 1 50th of the total area covered by that hypothesis. So then the likelihood is 0 0.02 or 1 in 50. Now, if I look at this more general hypothesis, I'm guessing that this year is about 1 20th the linear dimensions and therefore about 1 400th of the area, again, ignoring that it's a circle, not a square. So I'm now saying that the probability of the data given that more general hypothesis is 0 0.0025 or 1 in 400. So, if I now use the formulation of Bayes' theorem that prior odds times likelihood ratio equals posterior odds, and I've shown in another one of my videos how you get to that form of Bayes' theorem, that form of the equation. And let's say that we start off by believing that all hypotheses are equally likely. And now I want to compare this specific hypothesis outlined in red with this vague hypothesis outlined in blue. And then 
I calculate that like this. So my prior uh, odds are one to one. They're equally likely. The likelihood ratio now is exactly what it says on the tin. It's the ratio of these likelihood, these conditional probabilities. So that is 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.025 or the 1 in 50 against the 1 in 400, and that equals a ratio of 8. So before we got this observation, this data point, we believed that the hypotheses were equally likely. Once we've got that data point and taking into account that this hypothesis is more specific and that therefore this data point has a better likelihood ratio for the specific than for the vague hypothesis. Uh, and basically the ratio of area of, so of this dot compared to this, that is eight times larger than the, air, the ratio of the area of this dot compared to this which gives us the likelihood. So and then we have the ratio of the likelihoods, that's eight. So now we consider this specific hypothesis to be eight times as likely as this hypothesis, even though the data supported both. So certainly they support both hypotheses compared to one that covers this space that therefore doesn't overlap with the observation. So both of them are more likely than something that simply doesn't pre uh, predict those data at all. But this year predicts the data more precisely and that makes it a better hypothesis. So it's more predictive and we can use Bayes' theorem to show that it is actually favored over the vague hypothesis. That's also the reason why if I claim I have the ultimate scientific hypothesis and I judge the ultimate scientific hypothesis only by is it consistent with the data and I totally ignore how specifically it predicts the data. So I look only for consistency with the data, not ability to predict. If I do that, if I make that mistake, then the ultimate hypothesis is it's a funny old world, anything could happen. And no matter what data you give me, I say, that's consistent with my hypothesis. Give me the Nobel Prize. And of course, you wouldn't be impressed because I can't predict anything. And that is what's, what I've just demonstrated here more formally, that the more specific a hypothesis is, if it then, if then the data it predicts very specifically actually show up, then that hypothesis is much more supported than a vague hypothesis. And it also links up with the concept of falsifiability. It's much easier for data to be outside of the parameter volume covered by the specific hypothesis than by the vague hypothesis. So therefore the specific hypothesis is the more falsifiable one. Then what happens if we get three observations, which all fit in here? Well, we ended up with posterior odds eight here. Then for the second data point, we would apply the same likelihood ratio. So that's again a likelihood ratio of eight. So that would be eight squared. Then for the third hypothesis, we then have eight squared. So we have a likelihood ratio, uh, sorry, posterior odds of 64. We again apply that likelihood ratio and we end up uh, with the eight cubed with that likelihood ratio. So we end up with this here. So by the time we've collected three observations, the more specific hypothesis has gone from as likely as a vague hypothesis, which was our original prior, it has gone to 512 times as likely as the um, vague hypothesis. This is also the reason why, for example, um, a young earth creationism, it's a vague hypothesis because it assumes that an omnipotent God could do absolutely anything. Therefore, 
the creationist hypothesis is consistent with absolutely anything, which makes it a vague hypothesis. And therefore the fit to the data is just not impressive. Evolution is much more restrictive. It says a lot of things shouldn't be happening. And so when the things that shouldn't be happening don't happen, don't show up in the observational data, and only those things that have been predicted by the more specific hypothesis, that favors the more specific hypothesis. So you can see that also by this example. Imagine that I think of a category, I give you an instance or exemplar of that category, and I ask you, what category am I thinking of? Now, it might be physical objects that I have randomly chosen from all the physical objects I know to give you an instance. It might be living things that I've randomly chosen from those, or it might be flowers. Now, flowers is the most specific that fits the data, unless you know enough botany to know what uh, uh, family or species this is. But if we just stick to flowering plants, that is something that uh, everyone knows. So we could say this is a flower. And if I now go to three observations, and they're also all flowers, it would be a really odd coincidence if I had been thinking of physical objects and out of all the physical objects that exist. I mean, right in front of me, I see a ceramic mug, I see a charger, I see, of course, a computer, I uh, see a yogurt tub, an MP3 recorder. Out of all these things um, that I could have used as examples, books, of course, glasses, um, uh, there are office chairs, a telephone. So out of all these things, why would I come up with three flowers? Uh, so that, that would be really odd. Therefore, it's likely that the what these things have in common, the smallest hypothesis that fits them all, that the most specific category, that this is a correct category. And so that would determine at what level you go in that hierarchical system. So it depends on what you've been discussing. So now one thing is, if you misjudge how specific a hypothesis is, so if you present it with something extremely vague, but you think it's specific, then of course you misjudge how impressed you should be. And that would be then the uh, Bayesian explanation of the Barnum or Fora effect, uh, which you can admire in action when Darren Brown uh, performs cold reading. So uh, Fora was inspired by the question why people believe in horoscopes. And he then created statements that were inspired by horoscopes. So these were really vague statements, told students that he had developed a new personality tests and asked them to fill in his test. He then the next week came back and said, here, I have the results of your test and I want you to tell me how good my personality test is. And it's very important that you don't show your tests, your results to each other because this is personal information. But what Fora had done is he had thrown away all the answers and had given everyone exactly the same answer. And still people were really impressed with how good the test was, which is exactly what Darren Brown is doing here. Only he has developed, he has updated and developed these statements so that they work even better than for us uh, original statements. And so one way this could be interpreted is that people mistake these vague statements for something specific, and that's why they get so impressed. Another effect you could get from mistaking something vague for something precise and therefore specific is that you would be impressed by bullshit. So uh, Penny Cook and colleagues have done some research on that, have created bullshit statements like wholeness quiets infinite phenomena, 
uh, and uh, compared this to people's acceptance of more profound, uh, more uh, conventional statements and also motivational statements. So how good are people at distinguishing these things? And uh, Penny Cook also won the Ig Nobel Prize for that recently, the prize that is awarded for research that first makes you laugh and then makes you think. So susceptibility to bullshit could be explained by misjudging the volume of a hypothesis in this hypothesis space and therefore thinking it's more specific and therefore more uh, impressive. Size of hypothesis spaces is also relevant to a finding in a hypothesis testing task, which usually is presented as evidence of an irrational bias, namely confirmation bias. And the Bayesian interpretation suggests that actually this is not as much of a fallacy, not as much of a mistake as it is uh, usually presented. So the task is you are presented with a triplet of numbers 2, 4 and 6 and you're told they've been generated according to a rule and the way you test, you, the way you find out what that rule is, you generate other triplets of numbers and you get told whether they fit the rule that has generated two, four, six. And so here are an example. Uh, here's an example of one participant doing this, one subject. So first instance is two, four, six, and that fits the rule. So that is given. So then that person uh, suggests the triplet eight, ten, twelve, and gets told yes, that fits the rule, and this was based, so this triplet was generated based on the hypothesis that two are added each time. Then the subject comes up with a slightly different rule. So now that is actually more specific in that it specifies even numbers, which this hypothesis didn't. It only said two added each time and it might start off with an odd number. It might be one, three and five. But here, it's so it's more specific in what numbers go into it, but less specific in that it only says an order of magnitude instead of saying adding two. So actually, the subject has changed the hypothesis here and may not quite have realized that because now here it's 20, 22, 24, which is even numbers like that hypothesis says, but also says it's adding two each time instead of just generally order of magnitude. Then here the even numbers are abandoned, but the adding two is maintained. So two added to preceding number. And now the subject suggests, uh, says, yes, I'm, I think I know what the rule is. The rule is that starting with any number, two is added each time to form the next number. And that is incorrect. So tries again, two, six, ten, and finds that, yeah, uh, uh, that confirms that a spacing of two, that adding two is not necessary. And the 2610 was generated according to a new hypothesis. The middle number is the arithmetic mean of the other two. And the next triplet is again generated according to this hypothesis. And then proposes that rule and is wrong again. Then same number, seven added each time, so comes back to something like this, which doesn't actually fit. So it doesn't actually fit a triplet that this subject has already produced because that fits the rule that generated the original 246 and uh, um, it's less restrictive. So it, it's not adding seven. So it's a bit of a puzzle why this hypothesis, which again is fairly specific, then tries adding three each time, that works, and then 
has the hypothesis, which fits this here again, that the difference between two numbers, so this is basically same difference between those two uh, first two numbers as the difference between the second and the third number. And that is again wrong. Then tries to go the other way, 12, 8, 4, so descending series. And that is inconsistent with the rule. Um, then the rule is adding a number always the same one to form the next number, which is the same as the previous hypothesis, and therefore again incorrect, and then comes up with a hypothesis, any three numbers in order of magnitude, which is 1, 4, 9, which is yes. So there are a number of mistakes in there, but one of the things is that there was a tendency to either stick to a hypothesis and generate numbers according to an existing hypothesis or a hypothesis that could be mistaken for one that has been formulated because this is someone who occasionally got mixed up. Now, what you're supposed to do in hypothesis testing is trying to falsify, and therefore this generating triplets only according to an existing hypothesis, which is then confirmation instead of falsification, that is considered to be a fallacy. But now look in the hypothesis space at the possible cases you might have. It might be that the hypothesis you have developed is actually the true hypothesis. So in the hypothesis space, that would mean they are identical sets. And so where H is a subject's hypothesis, T is the target rule that has the rule that the experimenter has used to generate the numbers, and u is all possible number triples, of which there are, of course, infinitely many. And so this is then all the other triple, uh, triples. Then you have situation two, where your hypothesis is less general, that is more specific than the true hypothesis. So then if you're generating numbers only in here, then you will never generate any numbers either here or here, and therefore you will never falsify this hypothesis by stepping outside it and still finding that the uh, number triplet has been generated according to the true hypothesis. Now, one thing is, in the previous case, so in this here, I said that the more specific hypothesis, so for a given amount of data, the more specific hypothesis gets more support. But that is only true when the environment, when you basically um, just sample anything, and uh, so when the environment provides the data for you and you don't pick and choose the data. If you choose what you look at, so if you don't look at anything in here, then really you can't say that the likelihood ratio is this area divided by this whole area because you have excluded all these things out here. So then for both hypotheses, you say that the likelihood is the area covered by the data divided by the area in which you look. And if that area is defined by a specific hypothesis, then of course uh, you are um, you are biasing things. So that's basically, you're not distinguishing between the hypotheses. They have the same uh, likelihood, and therefore that likelihood ratio wouldn't be this here. The likelihood ratio would always be one, and therefore you don't actually change your mind. The data will not distinguish between the hypotheses. Right? So instead of these data, uh, which, which favor flowers, then uh, you could have gotten these data. So if you let the environment pick the data, if the more general hypothesis is true, it would have been possible to get these data instead of these. But if you choose the data and you only choose flowers, then the mathematics are different. 
and then the more specific hypothesis is not favored over the more general hypothesis right so when you do this here when you choose your triplets according to that um, uh, to your hypothesis that is a different uh, um, situation you can't include that larger area you're not favoring either hypothesis and so but in practical terms that is actually not that big a problem so if you're only sticking to your hypothesis in this case you've not got a problem because your hypothesis happens to be already the true hypothesis in this case as far as the experiment is concerned you're wrong but imagine the question is what is safe to do so what can you do for example that doesn't kill you and maybe you say that walking out on the frozen lake is only safe when you can see ice being um, as thick as that in everything you can see and when for example there is no current in the lake that can push up warmer water so uh, you have a very specific hypothesis where you basically say ice ranges only within a small uh, range someone else has a broader hypothesis who basically says i'm willing to walk on much thinner ice and maybe that is a true hypothesis but if your hypothesis is a true one so if it's equal and you try to falsify you break through the ice and die while here basically you're not stepping on ice that might be safe to walk on but basically what do you gain from stepping on that ice if stepping on that ice isn't that important then you're fine with this more restrictive hypothesis with playing it safe in terms of hypothesis testing if your hypothesis is more general than the true hypothesis so if the true hypothesis is very specific then uh, your generating data according to your hypothesis sometimes may end up within the true hypothesis but sometimes will end up outside here in which case you're falsifying your hypothesis so you haven't got a problem when there's a partial overlap again sometimes you will falsify your hypothesis you will find out that it is not the true one when they don't overlap same thing the moment you generate one instance according to your hypothesis you are told no it's wrong so that was the descending number triplet was an example of that right so this confirmation bias is really only a problem in one out of five possible situations and so once you take into account uh, the form of the hypothesis space uh, then and also the possible costs and benefits of different kinds of correct and wrong decisions then the confirmation bias isn't quite so severe a fallacy in inductive reasoning now the next topic is acquiring inductive constraints where the idea is for example i give you an instance a that is some location in our hypothesis space or parameter space and then I give you B and C and I ask you is either one of those the same category as A and in order to answer that question I need to know something about the normal variation along each of those axes so for example if the variation along this axis usually is high and the variation along this axis is low then I might actually decide that A and B are in the same category but A and C are not so let's look at something more concrete can you guess what category I'm illustrating by these instances and when I do that in class people very quickly say this illustrates the category would then I give you this and people say either steel or metal I present this and people say that's the category water <clears throat> 
then this year they usually say bicycle, this year chair, and this year boat. Now, when I put them all together, you'll find that there are examples, instances of a category that come up in more than one case. So for example, this year, then we had for this year and this year, we have wooden bicycles, we have wooden chairs, we have wooden uh, uh, boats, so here and here. So individual examples can come up in more than one category. What you're classifying them, so which the relevant category is, depends on what else it goes with, what else is relevant. So uh, next, there is another thing here. You can make a distinction between the three categories I have here. So you can make a more general category, a category of categories, just like we had previously. We had Labradors, which are one kind of dog. So they are a subset of dogs. So if you look at Labradors versus Irish Wolfhounds versus Schnauzers versus Dachshunds, so Labrador is itself a category with many instances, but there is a more general category that includes all the more specific categories uh, of uh, kinds of dog. And the same thing I can do here. So there is a more general category that unites all this and a more general category that unites all this. And you can try to make a guess of that. And the answer is that these here are all substances. These here are all objects. And then if you take that back to hypothesis spaces, so the idea is you look at the data and you find that for some things, say size and shape are pretty similar. So basically when we have the objects, they have something in common about size and shape. And here, boats, there's also some commonality about size and shape. And again, here, there's some commonality. Well, if I look at the physical properties, uh, then these are actually quite variable for objects. So I can make boats out of various materials, out of wood, plastic, steel, aluminium, uh, and so on. Uh, I can make bicycles out of various materials. Again, metals, um, uh, artificial composites like carbon fiber in epoxy, uh, wood, bamboo, and so on. And chairs here, wide variety of materials. Then uh, I can look at wood. And wood can make various objects in that are quite different because they're different objects, so different sizes, different shapes, but similar physical properties. So electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, density, hardness, um, color, these things will be relatively uniform across different examples of things made out of wood. I can do the same thing for these substances. So the idea then is, at a low level, I find that I have objects which I put into the same category because they are quite similar in shape and size to each other. Then I look across objects and I find that these objects have in common that uh, they have uh, relatively similar size and shape, but different physical properties. Here, for the substances, I find I have relatively uh, similar physical properties, but different size and shape. And therefore, I make a distinction then between substances and objects. Looking at another example, here I have uh, one set of objects made according to a particular rule. Here I have another set of objects, uh, another set of instances, sorry. And here again, another set, and here again, another set. And you can then guess uh, 
that this is a bit like substances and uh, objects. So I then have examples of categories where I have all the same number, but I have different colors. Or I have identical color, but a range of numbers. If I then give you these two, which are the same number but vary in color, then you can guess what else would complete that. So you can guess at the missing instances, namely that there will be other eights of different colors. That would complete the set. If I give you a 7 and a 12 in the same color, then you can guess that the missing uh, numbers will be first of all the numbers in between, again printed in red, and given that the previous range has been slightly larger than this, that there would be a number on either side. So basically we have then one category was the eights in various colors, and then numbers from 7 to 12, and actually, well, either from 7 to 13, because the range so far has been that large, or else from 6 to 12. So these are our uh, possible hypotheses. So, and that now, saying that at the lower level, so these sets here, you say one set, I have one kind of thing that has variation in this direction, and little variation in this axis, and the other has lots of variation in this axis, this dimension, and little variation along this dimension, this axis here. So then I declare, as with the substances and objects, that these are at yet another level uh, something more general. And I might even generalize that to other cases. So for example, here I have two different shapes, uh, sorry, two of the same shape in different colors. And I might guess that this generalizes to more of the same shape in different colors. And so if I now plot that at the lower level, I have a hypothesis space like this. So I take my data, I look here, for example, at number versus color. And then I look here at number versus color and here at number versus color and I find a regularity. And if I now look how variable are these in width, so I look here at the range, the variability in width, that's relatively high. I look at the variability in number or length and that variability is relatively low. So when I plot this in this more abstract space, that would be an over hypothesis. So I now have parameters that describe my lower level hypothesis, just as the dots here describe parameters uh, that specify that describe your sensory data. So I can basically go one level more abstract and instead of having a parameter space that describes the sensory data, I have a parameter space that describes a hypothesis about sensory data. And that's the same as going from individual instances to uh, either um, chairs versus boats versus bicycles or to wood versus water versus steel. So I can make hypotheses at different levels. So then if I have these kinds of categories, so those have large variation in number and little variation in color, and I have these kinds of categories, lots of variation in color, little variation in number. So these would then, in that over hypothesis, these would be quite different from each other. But if in this more general space, this more general abstract space uh, for the over hypothesis, I were asked, well, this here shares a category with one of those two things, then I would be guessing that actually here's a category which is this way because 
this year is closer to that, therefore more similar to this than to that. So I would guess, if anything, these two belong together. Okay. So now having over hypotheses like this speeds up learning because it gives structure to what happens at a lower level. So a child exposed to a new word referring to something of varied shape but similar physical properties across instances can guess this must be a word for substance. That then narrows down both what the relevant properties are and in what context the word can be expected to occur. So if I hear rubber, which is a substance, I'm expected to focus on physical properties and I can expect, it, uh, expect that physical properties are relevant to what can be done. So if meaning is ultimately grounded in what can you do or what can be done and what, how do you feel about that, then uh, this, these over hypotheses are important because by choosing substance versus uh, object names, I am focusing, I am communicating what is supposed to be relevant, which of the properties are supposed to be relevant. And uh, for the child, it helps basically narrow down the hypotheses the child has to um, consider. And at the lower level, because you have these constraints, the more general hypothesis, if I say this is a substance, then that gives me a more specific hypothesis uh, that I can match to the data at the lower level. And that specific hypothesis can be supported by fewer data points supported over other hypotheses. So it can be more easily falsified. And if it's easily falsified, if it then makes these specific predictions and the predictions come true, then I have greater trust that it really is true. And so this hierarchical Bayesian structure can actually speed up learning. Now, further uh, uh, ideas on developing inductive frameworks. Imagine you have this sort of data set and you can fit different hypotheses to it. You can fit a single very general hypothesis to it two slightly more specific ones or many very specific hypotheses. So these here give you very good fit, but it's complicated. It, the simplicity isn't good. This here is very simple, but it doesn't give you good fit. Now, the simplicity actually translates into a specific hypothesis at a higher level. So if, for example, I say that how big that hypothesis is or where that hypothesis is within that parameter space. If these are always rectangles, I could specify that by the coordinates, the X and Y coordinates of that corner and the X and Y coordinates of that corner. So the over hypothesis, then this vague hypothesis would be one particular point in a four-dimensional space. So it would be a single point. This here would be two four-dimensional points, two points in four-dimensional space. So if I now project that onto only two dimensions, that means I have two different points, which means that the over hypothesis is more general than this one. And the same would apply to this. So basically what I'm trading off here is actually the specificity versus generality of hypotheses at different level. So the simplicity, high simplicity, translates to a specific hypothesis in the more abstract uh, over hypothesis and lower simplicity it translates to a vaguer, a larger volume hypothesis um, uh, in the more at the more abstract level, at the over hypothesis level. So that is something about trading of parsimony against goodness of fit. Now, let's 
pay attention to only three data points for the uh, uh, next idea. And now let's say, why would you favor this year versus that year? So what else could make you favor one over the other? Now let's think about the precision with which you uh, know these data. If you believe that your knowledge is very imprecise, so that you have to say, if I just look across here, that I say the x value of this year is minus three, the x value of this point here is 1.5, and the x value of this point here is 2.5, with uh, standard deviations of two, which would be a precision of 0.25, because it's uh, precision is defined as inverse variance, and variance is the square of the standard deviation. So if I have standard deviation two, variance would be four, and precision would be one over four. So that means that really I should describe these data points as these smudges, these spread out smudges. And when they look like this, well, they don't really look very different from each other because I have only this vague information. And so when I either have information that really is imprecise or I believe that it's imprecise because remember these precision estimates are necessarily subjective. If I believe it's imprecise, then I would rather lump these together into a single category, so I would have a simple hypothesis that is a bit vague. If, on the other hand, I believe that I have very specific, very precise information, these really look different from each other, and therefore I might rather favor the notion that I should fit a separate hypothesis to each of those if I believe I have precise information. Now, uh, there is a proposal by van der Kroos and colleagues who derive from a misjudgment like this the symptoms of autism. Now, separately, Frith has made an argument that if you believe you have more precise information than you really have, and that therefore you overestimate um, prediction error, that this leads to the, that this can explain at least some of the symptoms of psychosis. Now, van der Kroos and colleagues start with exactly the same assumptions. They have the same starting point, but they then fit that to the symptoms of autism. And I'm not the first one to have noticed that there is a bit of a conflict there. And uh, one suggestion that has been made is that possibly it makes a difference that in autism you would have this from very early on and you create adaptations, uh, while in psychosis typically it kicks in much later and you don't have the same compensation mechanisms. But without knowing what those compensation mechanisms might be, at the moment this is still hand-waving, this is still pure speculation. So anyway, let's see how van der Kroos derive from this belief that uh, uh, the information at this low level is quite precise, which we, as we've seen, might come with more general over hypotheses. So at the lower level, then information is believed to be precise. And then van der Kroos say that leads to detail focus because small differences seem meaningful. So that difference from this mean to this mean doesn't seem meaningful because the information, the, uh, uh, the means are not known very precisely. So they're known only with uh, uh, um, great uh, variance. While here the variance is small, the precision is high, and so that difference seems a lot more meaningful. So that means that what to other people seem like small differences, if you believe you have precise information, they seem like large differences. Then that should lead to sensory overload because those differences that feel so large attract the attention that you need to learn these new categories. 
then repetitive motion to create predictable data that don't generate sensory overload. Another um, uh, symptom of autism that is supposed to be derived from this is special interests. So you deal only with a narrow range of data. And if you deal only with the narrow range and you know a lot about uh, 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 this topic, then you can predict them quite precisely. And you would also be more interested in predictable systems, which is not people because game theory and uh, experience tells you uh, that people quite often are deliberately misleading and therefore difficult to predict. Then uh, we have recently found that people uh, uh, with higher tendencies toward autism are biased against uh, accepting bullshit. That might also come uh, from um, having at the low level precise information or believing you have precise information, which means that your general experience is that the over hypotheses, so the more abstract hypotheses, seem to be relatively vague. And if you therefore uh, treat the abstract hypotheses as generally vague, at least unless you have a really good causal generative model like you have in physics. So if you say generally these, vague, uh, these ge uh, abstract hypotheses are vague, then if someone gives you something abstract and you haven't got specific reason to believe that it's precise, you will treat it as vague and therefore not be impressed. So um, that then would also fit with the notions of what um, happens in hierarchical Bayesian models uh, uh, when you're on the autistic spectrum. Then another thing is if you now look at this here, so you have say a few data points and you start off by having a vague and general hypothesis. As you get more data, you find that there's extra structure in there, and then you basically trade this off, and you have then this more complicated hypothesis. You get yet more data, and then you discover yet more additional uh, structure uh, in there. So the idea then is that this lower row shows the development of, of expertise, an ability to make finer distinctions and additional hierarchical structure in the hypothesis space, because really the diagram on the right actually should look like this, so that you have not just the more specific hypotheses, but also this kind of hypotheses. Uh, so for example, uh, you say, these are Labradors, these are Irish wolfhounds, these are chihuahuas, and all of them are dogs, and all of these are animals. So that's uh, where you can again have, uh, at, at that kind of level, you can have then hierarchies. So then how do you apply base theorem to more than two possible states of the world. I've shown that. I hope you have some idea how that uh, generalizes to the continuous case. Namely, as you add more and more possible discrete states of the world, if you have infinitely many, then the whole thing becomes continuous. So you can see that base theorem should generalize to a continuous case. A hierarchical Bayesian model is one which applies base theorem at several different levels of of description. A hypothesis space describes uh, what your data could look like, so uh, what uh, it displays in, in a space of abstract parameters, parameters that describe your data. It says this hypothesis predicts that data should only appear within that volume of that parameter space, of that hypothesis space. Then we've seen that Bayesian interpretation of evidence favors more specific hypotheses over vague hypotheses because of the way that the, um, uh, the relationship between an individual data point, uh, 
and the uncertainty about the data point, how that relates to the volume of the uh, hypothesis in the parameter space. Right? So that uh, the ratio of how much volume is covered by the data by each individual observation versus how much is covered by the hypothesis. That gives you the likelihood. Then you do that for different hypotheses where you have different ratios that give you uh, different likelihoods. And then that uh, results in that calculation that favors the more specific hypotheses. Then we've just looked at the balance between goodness of fit versus simplicity and that perceived precision can tilt that balance of goodness and fit uh, versus simplicity.